is here in my chat room. I am not a robot. This is the <laughs> forever claim the on the internet. Yeah. Am I a robot? I am not a robot. I am not a robot. Some days I feel like one. Ooh, forever I'm playing claim back in my on the internet. Yeah. Sorry about that. Playing back on the internet. We are live. Haha. <laughs> Recursive forever and ever and ever. Let me get started here to introduce everything, everybody. We are getting started with this special makeup interview. <laughs> Yay! Welcome everyone to This Week in Science. I'm Dr. Kiki and today we are having a special makeup interview with Dr. Suzanne Brander. Unfortunately, during our live broadcast Wednesday night, the internet failed us and we lost contact with Dr. Brander <laughs> and we have rescheduled and today are making up this, uh, the audio from this episode, this special interview will be put into the podcast so everyone will get a chance to hear all the wisdom she has to impart on us. But without further ado, let me remind you that if you have not ever subscribed to This Week in Science, you can do so by hitting the subscribe button here on YouTube or heading to twist.org for subscription information. Dr. Suzanne Brander is an ecotoxicologist working as an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental and Molecular Toxicology at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. She also holds an adjunct position in the Department of Biology and Marine Biology at the University of North Carolina. According to her lab website, her lab's research encompasses the fields of toxicology, endocrinology, and ecology. It integrates molecular approaches with measurements at the organism and population level. Their main focus is on the effects of stressors, such as emerging pollutants, plastics, big thing for everyone these days, and changing climate on aquatic organisms. But their work spans the links between ecology and human health. Dr. Brander, welcome to This Week in Science. And thank you so much for offering the opportunity to make up the, um, the snafu from, from Wednesday. I greatly <laughs> <laughs> I'm just excited that we're able to make this work because I, uh, when I found out about you and your work, I was very excited about getting the chance to talk with you about what you do. So to jump into this conversation, let's uh, start with your background. Um, we both went to UC Davis at mm -hmm. one point in our educational career, but how did you get to where you are now as an ecotoxicologist? And that's, that's a really good question. And I think I mentioned this before on Wednesday before we got, it's not as if I, you know, decided that I was going to be an ecotoxicologist when I was, you know, a 12 year old reading, reading a book on toxicology, it really a bit of a, a long and winding road because I, I didn't have any scientists in my family growing up. So I, you know, would pick up all the trash on the way to the bus stop and be concerned about impacts on the environment. But I didn't know you could make a, a career out of that. So it was sort of gradual. I went to, I minored in biology, and then I went and got a degree in environmental science and policy as a master's student. And sort of through that journey, I started to meet other people who were doing research, who were getting PhDs. I thought, well, that sounds really cool. And after working for a couple of years, um, I back for a PhD and I was lucky enough to be in the San Francisco area and you know the the UC Davis Marine Lab was was right up the road uh, in on the Sonoma coast and so that's that's kind of how I landed there um, try, it was, it, I became a toxicologist a little bit by trial and error and a little bit by luck and a little bit by just being in the right place at the right time in some ways so can we talk a little bit about what ecotoxicology is? What, it, what exactly is this area of study? Oh, that's a great question. So the field of toxicology is any, um, any type of research science that uh, investigates how uh, chemicals or other environmental stressors um, interact with our physiology, interact with with organisms, um, in some cases, adverse effects, um, and 
the questions surround things like other chemical do you need to cause an adverse effect? Do those um, we observe scale up and cause issues with the overall health of a population? Talking about toxicology, much of that focuses on effects on human health, which of course is a big concern. You know, everything from air pollution to water pollution um, to other stressors affect, affect human health greatly in a lot of ways. But ecotoxicology, that is specific to effects on organisms in the environment other than humans. So um, there are people who study effects on terrestrial animals, so animals that live on land, and then I in particular study effects in animals that live in the water, so in, in rivers, lakes, um, estuaries. And so ecotoxis, it kind of broadly encompasses um, a description of the science involved in studying the responses of all of those organisms to, to stressors, mostly pools, but now we're thinking more about interactive effects, you know, everything that comes along, for example. Right. And the, the aquatic environment is one, I mean, we live on land, right? So land animals, what's happening in the air and on the land is something that's very important to us. But how does the health of the aquatic ecosystem feedback to affect us? Sure, sure. So in, in lots of ways, well, you know, all of the all of the chemicals that are getting into the water are, like you said, originating on land. You know, treated wastewater, be they from runoff from agricultural lands, um, from industrial facilities. And so all of those chemicals that are present in the water are likely present in some form in the air or, you know, or in our in our food. And um, we're as as we get further along this field, we're coming to realize that responses that we observe in aquatic organisms, in particular fish, who are also vertebrates just like us. Um, that many of those responses um, are very similar to what we see in humans. And so the responses we're seeing in fish when it comes to things like disruption of um, hormones or, you know, which then can scale up to disruptions in growth or effects on reproduction, how many offspring they're able to have. We often see those types of responses mimicked in, in, in humans and in terrestrial animals as well. And so we're all we're all connected in that way. At the cellular level, we're, we're all pretty similar. So when you're, what you're studying in the water, what, can, what, are, what are you looking at? Um, one category of these stressors that we know of that do affect humans are endocrine disruptors. Can you talk a little bit, bit about those and the other things that you study? Sure, sure. And, and I've been studying endocrine disruptors since I started my PhD um, about 12 years ago now, that so <laughs> it, it, it sneaks up on you. So um, I remember riding, I was riding in one of the Muni trains in San Francisco, and this was back before I had thought about going back for a PhD, but I'd been reading about people being concerned about feminization of fish. And then there was a, a poster up in the Muni that was instructing people not to flush their, their drugs down the toilet because of this concern that you could be feminizing fish. And, right. and I was like, well, that's probably an oversimplification, but that sounds really interesting and I wanna learn more about that. And so I ended up focusing um, my PhD work on the effects of endocrine disruptors, mostly from agricultural runoff. Um, and so it turns out that endocrine disruptors, which interfere with hormone function, come, from, come in many different flavors. You have pharmaceuticals that run off into water, um, usually from wastewater treatment plant effluent that come from things that are designed to, inter to mimic hormones. So birth control pills, for example, those have mm. synthetic chemicals in them that look a lot like estrogen and testosterone or progesterone that are produced by our bodies and by, and by fish as well. They use the same, same hormones. And then you have things like pesticides um, there's a class of pesticides that is used across the country now called pyrethroids. And some of those, um, so when you're spraying your lawn for, you know, to prevent mosquitoes from coming in and attacking you, you may also be contributing a little bit to, to runoff that then can interfere with, with endocrine function. There's also industrial chemicals that we've all heard of, like bisphenol A and, and the, 
you know, a scat of other plasticizers. So they come from many different sources. And the <clears throat> tricky thing about um, chemicals that interfere with hormone function is that you don't need a lot of it to cause an effect. Our endocrine system is incredibly sensitive and you will respond to a chemical that's at a, a picomolar concentration. So to put that in perspective, it's like a one drop of that chemical in an Olympic sized swimming pool, if you wow. want to think concentration. So, so people will say, well, we're not, no, there's not that much runoff getting into the water. It's diluted, right? It's, it's at a very low level, but it turns out you don't, you don't need a lot to cause at least subtle effects that can cause a fish to stop laying as many eggs, for example. So when you're talking about feminization of the fish, um, I mean, sounds like that's great. Wouldn't that lead to more egg laying all around? In, in some cases, yes. In some <laughs> cases, it's, it's more complicated than it sounds. And we had a model that we published last year where we looked at kind of the trade-offs between feminization and masculinization. Mm -hmm. And so, and one of the points that that paper made was, well, if you have just the right levels of um, estrogenic chemicals and androgenic chemicals kind of mixing together in a waterway, and that's what the fish are exposed to, then yeah, you don't, you don't, they, in some cases they can cancel each other out, but it gets more complicated mm. than that because along with feminization can, maybe you're producing more eggs, but those offspring end up being lower quality, for example there's almost always a trade-off or you grow more quickly, but that might make you more vulnerable to predation or it might mean again that you, you produce offspring earlier, but those offspring are less healthy. So there, there are lots of observations like that in, in the literature across, across organisms. So it's, you might make more eggs, but they might not be as good. Right. So. so, yeah. So it just, it's situational really. It depends on what's going on in the water in terms of, uh, the chemical concentrations. It also depends on the individuals the, and the species that are there themselves. That's yeah. Right. So when you're talking about these animals, the there's the individual effects, like the endocrine disruptors affecting an individual. How do the individual effects parlay into population level effects that really have an effect on evolution and generational things? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so in the same study that came out last year, we did look, basically compiled a bunch of different laboratory experiments that have been done and um, came up with a model that predicted what population levels might be if in the situation fish were exposed to X, Y, and Z chemicals, um, examples of chemicals in the water. And um, for, for the most likely combination, it was about a 30% decline in population numbers for this particular species of fish. Whether that translates to other species, we're not sure. There have been many other papers published um, across fish, across other organisms showing showing similar effects. So it's not, and I, I think that's sometimes why it doesn't get um, as much, there's, there's not as much alarm about the situation because you know, 20 or 30% doesn't sound maybe like that much to right. some of you know, not in the sciences, not not sort of surrounded by this, this stuff. Um, but over time, that can add up. And if you're talking about a fish that you like to eat, for example, that that could eventually mean that you have, you have less of that fish, at, you know, when you go out for sushi dinner, for example. So maybe that's that's a way to get, to get people's attention. So it's gradual. And um, some recent work we're showing um, is also demonstrating that these effects can be transferred across generations. And so if you expose parents mm -hmm. to low le levels of endocrine disruptors and then rear them out for a couple of generations, you're seeing reduced hatching success and reduced survival and altered growth in the unexposed generation. Huh. So, yeah, so, so not only do you see a carryover effect to the offspring, which isn't that surprising, but then you can call them the grand fish, I guess. The grand offspring, yeah. grandchildren are, we also see effects um, in those individuals as well. And that can then be scaled up to the population level. If you have fewer fish hatching, you're going to have fewer fish survive to, to adulthood. 
Right. Do we know how this is happening? Is this, I mean, we, I've, I've read about this in across literature where there's a stressor in one population and then, you know, the, the successive populate uh, generations have effects. And is this, do you think this is an epigenetic effect? Is that I read something recently about, um, about uh, RNA or epigenetic and, and um, transcription factors being packaged with sperm. <laughs> like, do we have any idea how this is having this long lasting effect generationally? Sure, there, there are a couple of different mechanisms. The main one that the most is known about is DNA methylation. Mm -hmm. And just, just to break that down a little bit, DNA methylation refers to the addition of small functional groups, small methyl groups. We won't get into the organic chemistry on this, but anyway, small, you can call them tags, like little tags that are being added to your DNA close to the area where a gene is. And they can dictate how often that gene is expressed. And so this has been shown from humans down to, and I think they, there was a paper out in sponges even with, you know, <laughs> sponges get their DNA methylated. So it's, it's highly conserved. All organisms have it to some extent. Um, plants, there's been a lot of study in plants, studies in plants, for example. But so these tags are added to your DNA dependent on events or stressors or, you know, good and bad that mm -hmm. you encounter throughout life. Um, I think one of the most interesting studies was done on um, Holocaust survivors and their, their children and grandchildren. And they were finding that the offspring and even grandchildren of Holocaust survivors were more likely to have certain types of anxiety disorders. And it wasn't based on experiences they had had in their own life, but it was based on stressors that occurred in their grandparents or parents lives and they were able to link that back to the methylation of particular in, in the area of particular genes and so we are now studying yeah it's it's crazy right and it makes you feel very cautious about what you're doing with your life because you don't want it to affect <laughs> you know your great grandchildren right but um but we're, we're looking at that in in fish in the lab now and it's been it's been looked at in other species in fish and determining that fish do have dna methylation and use it to um in a similar for similar purpose to um to mammals and humans um and so we're ho we're hoping to link the potential epigenetic effects we see in this current study to methylation and that um it's it's cranking away at the uc davis genome center right now Oh, so. fantastic. That's fascinating. Do you know how about how long, uh, like any estimate on how long this study is going to take? I'm supposed to present it at a conference in early November. So I'm hoping. Oh. Pretty, so yeah, so so should be should be in the next couple of weeks. Oh, that is exciting. That's going to be some interesting. Th those will be some interesting results for sure. Thinking about how how these epigen epigenetic factors work um, and, you know, things like endoc endocrine disruptors in the environment and having these transgenerational effects. I'm just wondering, how is this evolutionarily sustainable? Why would an organism want to methylate, control the regenerative or uh, reproductive capacity of the offspring? I mean, why, what benefit would that be? Really are there any question. ideas on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are. And the, there is now, um, so the, the Skinner lab up, I think he's at University of Washington, uh, came out with a, a paper a couple of years ago where he has put forth that the two um, events of epigenetic, meth, say methylation, or, or if it occurs via another mechanism, epigenetic modifications are probably linked to longer term evolutionary adaptation. And there is some evidence that genes that get methylated are then more likely to mutate down the line. More likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so, so that's not something I've done in my lab, but that's something that others have been looking at. And the thinking is that, okay, you are in a stressful environment, say there, there isn't a lot of food. And so the gene that controls 
how quickly you metabolize them gets methylated. And then that means your offspring, that gene is methylated in your offspring. And it's a situation where there's not enough food. Again, that situation continues. That offspring has quickly been, um, been able to adapt to that situation. But it's not always beneficial because what if, you know, if you're a human and you move from the situation where there's exactly. famine to where food is plentiful, then that offspring is predisposed to you know, metabolic disorders and, and that sort of thing. So it can be good, but it can also kind of backfire in a way. Yeah. And this lines up also with the rapid change in the environment currently due to climate change, where populations are potentially methylating for the current situation, but down the line, it may not be adaptive. Well, that's absolutely right. Your adaptation has to match with the right period and time and the right yeah. set of conditions. So if, if they don't, you don't, you, sometimes you get a mismatch and then that, yeah. and, and that's, that's really where I think um, part of, part of the field of toxicology is having to think about evolutionary toxicology and how, you know, be it, is, are, are these epigenetic mechanisms leading to resistance or are they leading to organisms that are more susceptible um, due to these trade-offs or due to a mismatch between the, um, the, the epigenetic tag that was laid down and the environment that they're currently you know, in? I love the the phrase that just struck me was evolutionary toxicology. I have never considered it. I I think of it in terms of the human lifespan and always have where what's happening to me in my lifetime. But suddenly we're at a point where we're thinking about how these compounds that we are releasing into the environment that are in the environment are affecting generations down the line. And that to me, that's a striking change in uh, like perspective in the questions that we would be able to ask. Yeah, it's it's a it's a huge new area, and a, and a, a colleague of mine, we're on a, a grant together on, on a different topic, but her lab at UMass has been studying um, mutations, specific mutations that allow invertebrates that are exposed to pesticides to resist become orders of magnitude more resistant to a pesticide exposure compared to um, one animal that hasn't been exposed. And it's really, it's incredibly interesting. Absolutely. Let's talk about uh, the disruptors that we are putting into the environment. You mentioned the endocrine disruptors. Uh, there was a paper out recently about PCBs and killer whales. Um, and how uh, there was another paper that we that we covered recently on the show about phthalates uh, in the mm -hmm. urine of dolphins. Um, and these all come from these are organic persistent organic chemicals. These are from plastics. Um, what kind what compounds are we what are the big concern compounds right now? The concerns, well, it, it comes from two two different two different sources and, and the two chemicals you mentioned are good examples. So PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, were used basically as, as flame retardants back in, and we banned them back in the 60s or 70s. I don't have the exact date in front of me, but they are so persistent because they bind to sediment. They're hydrophobic. Um, they, they sit in the sediments of aquatic areas of waterways and they are very good at getting into the food web and they tend to associate with fats, with lipids. And so they bioaccumulate and that's why you're seeing them at organisms at the top of the food chain, right? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to get rid of them. And I think that's something people don't evaluate or think about properly when we, when we design new chemicals. We don't necessarily think um, clear, Think enough about how persistent those chemicals are. So phthalates, that or phthalates are a type of chemical that are still being used as plasticizers. And um, you know the fact that we're seeing them in the urine of, of dolphins, we're seeing them at in, in organisms that are at, at higher food or higher trophic levels um, in food webs should be really. Sorry, my cat has just waved <laughs> down. <from laughs> they can screen. see the tail going from <laughs> the camera. <laughs> Hello, kitty cat. <laughs> What I'm talking about. It, it, it should be it should be alarming that we're we know 
we, we know what the characteristics of chemicals are that are going to be persistent in the environment. And we're seeing them three, four, you know, even five, in some cases, decades out, still, still hanging around, yet we're still developing new chemicals that are, you know, maybe not quite as persistent, but have many of those same characteristics. So it's, um, it's, it's problematic and something that we don't consider when we, you know, invent the latest plasticizer or the latest, you know, latest. Do you, um, do you think it's definitely. on, do you think it's on scientists, these, these material scientists who are coming up with the, you know, the chemists who are coming up with these new materials, do you think it is more on their minds now? I mean, in the sixties, it was plastic, everything, everyone has Tupperware, everyone, plastic bags, plastic wrap, plastic, plastic, plastic. And it was the thing, the fifties and sixties was the kitchen of the future. And it was this modern rage and it was making life better. You know, there are these, you know, uh, these advertisements for plastics, make your life better, you know, and now decades later, we realize how much plastics are getting into the environment and how much many of these, you know, like you mentioned, the PCBs and the phthalates, how they're getting into the environment and staying there. So is there a different, are, are we teaching the next, the chemists of the next generation, these considerations? No, I think I think there might be slightly more awareness. And when I think of um, plastics in the fifties and sixties, I always think of that movie, The Graduate, where um, so Dustin Hoffman asks what he should do with his future, and, and the person says plastics. It's all yes. But but, <laughs> and, but but nowadays, you know, it's and plastics are a really good example of where there should be more awareness. And I think there is. But then you also have the um, the fluorinated chemical um, industry, which produces PFOAs, yeah. PFOAs and all, and PFAS, which incorporates hundreds of, of different types of chemicals, but, you know, they're making things that are waterproof. They're making magical shirts that you spill, you know, tomato juice on and they, it doesn't stain. But, but, but the downside is, is that those chemicals that get, they get into waterways and they bioaccumulate and affect people, they affect wildlife. So I, I don't, Think there's enough awareness yet I think there's more but it's I don't think it's gotten to the point where it is influencing the design of chemicals in a way that chemicals are a lot safer today than, right. than they were decades ago I think they're they're marginally safer and we're, we're moving forward but um, but it's gonna take and the other challenge too is that there just aren't there isn't enough funding to test enough funding or time to I test all of those chemicals and that's a huge yeah. challenge the toxicologists that we need to come up with ways to be able to test hundreds of chemicals at one time and prioritize the ones that we should do further study on. And that's, that's a big stumbling block right now that we're trying to get through. Yeah. At this point, are you still in the phase of, well, this class of chemicals all have the same basic structure, so we'll just mm -hmm. lump them all together. That's, we're trying to find better ways. Toxicologists are trying to find better ways of doing that. And um, there, there was a call out from from the EPA uh, a couple of months ago that was trying to get at that very challenge. Okay, we have we have so many chemicals. We really need to get away from having all this testing um, that's based on using live animals, live fish, rats, what have you. <clears throat> um, and we need to have in vitro assays that you can run in a, in a plate really quickly and do lots of exposures at once. And so, so we're, we're getting there, but, but, but change is slow. And especially for, um, for ecotoxicology, you know, we don't necessarily have all the resources that, you know, a fancy um, National Institute of Health funded lab would have, right? You know, and so that the, yeah. there's always a little bit more funding for human health and that might move forward a little bit more quickly, but, we have to remind people that the two are, you know, intimately connected. Yeah. So, yeah. And we're okay. forward, but slowly. <laughs> slowly. <laughs> I'm glad we're moving forward. That is the, that is the big key here. Keep moving forward. I'm just what, I wonder how much, um, you know, like big data supercomputers that are able to, you know, crunch massive data sets to be able to look at molecular structures and how they line up with already, um, all, with what we already know about negative environmental or ecological impacts. 
And and that's a and that's a huge movement on the part of the EPA. They have a, a tox cast program that is trying to do just that and use um, things called quantitative structure activity relationships, which is a complicated way of saying group this class of chemicals here and group this this class of chemicals does that. Um, the the challenge is that first biology isn't always predictable, and right. sometimes sometimes things happen that you can't predict just by looking at the structure of the chemical in the deep fish and, and, and humans, and we metabolize chemicals that get into the body. And sometimes those metabolites are a bit more harmful or have different activity than the parent chemical did. And so that's that's something that's that's difficult to mimic with, with a cell line or with just, you know, a, com a, a computer program that classifies chemicals based on their, on their structure. So the, the challenge is there. Yeah, we're talking. So we're talking a bunch about this difference between fish and people. And you're involved in a, uh, a a study through NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, on um, marine debris. Mm -hmm. So looking at stuff like plastics in the environment. Could you talk a little bit about what you're seeing through your studies? And this is through uh, your your other position in uh, North Carolina, right? Yeah, so so technically it's all the same position, just, just to explain that. So before I came to OSU uh, a year ago, I was an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington for about three and a half years. And so when I moved, you know, of course, you don't always move all of, all of the ongoing grants because sometimes it makes more sense for them to stay where they were. And so because that study had already begun and it was on an East Coast fish, we left the study there, but it's still it's it's complicated. But it's still it's still <laughs> part, of, part of and I'm adjunct there now um, because I still do work there. But my main position is at is at LSU. But it's it's all all kind of in the same part and right. parcel. Um, but that study there, Noah was understandably concerned about um, microplastics and microfibers and what might be happening in commercial fishery species. You know, one, because we want to make sure that their numbers aren't being affected because their health is declining because of exposure to plastic. And two, because we don't want to eat the plastic ourselves or the chemicals associated with those plastics. So they, they focused their last call on, on commercial fishery species. And so we obtained some funding to look at black sea bass, which is a pretty pretty big commercial fishery off the east coast of the United States. States and also... Um, delicious and delicious, yeah. <laughs> yeah, delicious. Well, i haven't been able to eat them lately but um yeah. so, so the study consisted of two parts one um field uh -oh. Uh oh there goes the microphone the microphone uh one was a field component where um we went out and collected black sea bass um off the coast of north carolina from a couple of different sources just to confirm that they were ingesting plastics and, and we've confirmed that we found um, macroplastics so plastics that are bigger than five millimeters in diameter in the guts of of uh, a number of several sea bass and now we're looking so they're at eating big pieces of plastic not just the little tiny that's right but and we didn't find it in that many of them i think mm -hmm. out of 150 fish or so that were sampled we found macro larger pieces of plastics in three or four of them okay. but the thing to think about there is that they, they're going to excrete these um, plastics. So that's kind of a snapshot of what was happening on that particular day. Um, and so we confirmed plastic ingestion. We're now looking at micro plastics as well, which takes a little bit more effort and, and processing. Um, and then the second component of the study was to look at um, plastics in the lab to do a couple of different uh, dose levels of plastic and to look at um, responses that are relevant to the health of the fishes. So looking at immune response and respiration. So how much oxygen are they taking in? How, how much effort are they, are they um, taking to, to, to breathe, right? Pretty basic stuff. Or we'll be looking at gene expression um, down the line. And so the idea was to use the lab experiments to try to have a have a, an assessment of the risk that might be um, might be happening in the field. But how much risk is there to 
a black sea bass that has ingested three pieces of plastic? You know, what, what effects, what biological effects might be, um, might be sustained by that fish or might be occurring in that fish? And so that's the ultimate goal of the study. And I have to give a shout out to all the wonderful, all of my wonderful collaborators that are at University of North Carolina Wilmington, um, because the, the study would not happen without, you know, without them um, doing much of the, the heavy lifting right now. In terms of the plastic itself, I mean, I understand a piece of plastic, it doesn't have nutritional value. It is replacing food in the gut of the animal. Um, but what else would the plastic have in it that would be having an effect? Sure, sure. And I, I will speak briefly to the, um, the plastic taking up space in the gut and that lowering the, um, the amount of food that the organism can you know, obtain nutrition from. And we've seen in larval fish that if they're fed plastics, whether they be clean plastics or contaminated plastics, that either type will cause a reduction in weight um, if you grow them out after a short term exposure. And so just just the physical presence of the plastic itself can be problematic. But yeah. as far as chemicals, um, plastics like lipids and like sediment are really good at sticking to anything that doesn't like to mix with water. So if you have a chemical like PCB, so we'll get back to these persistent organic pollutants, Lots of persistent organic pollutants like PCBs, um, DDT, which we still find um, in the environment, still still everywhere, and hello, cat. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to hang out with me until now. Yeah. Um, those types of chemicals are, are found to be associated with plastics. And so the concern is that as a plastic um, hangs out in the water as it kind of ages, it's gonna have more of these types of chemicals adhere to it, absorb to it, and then it becomes kind of a, a chemical cocktail if a fish swallows it. Okay, no way, it becomes a way for those chemicals that have stuck to the plastic to be delivered, to be, you know, it's like, like taking like taking your, your daily dose of, of DDT. It's a little pill that has DDT and PCB and all these other things mixed in with it. Um, Delicious. <laughs> exactly. It sounds wonderful. But, but, and now the question is, and something else we want to get at with our, the NOAA work, um, it's an experiment planned hopefully for next year. We've been a little bit waylaid by the hurricane yeah. that Carolina, um, is to look at whether, do we really, how much of a concern should there be? Because they're pretty low levels of these chemicals. Do they leach off into the fish? If they do, where do they go? How long does it take? how much gets there. And so is it a concern for the fish and is it also a concern for the person eating um, eating the, the fish? So that's that's where we are. There, we know we know that plastics are, are are kind of soaking up these chemicals. We just don't know how dangerous they are. Yeah. Yeah. So those are that's the big question at this point in time. Exactly how dangerous, what kind of effect. Is there a uh, a is there any way to clean up these plastics? I mean, the microplastics, I mean, go, I think my fiber, my, my sweater here is natural fibers. Should, should I be worried about my, the fleece that I wear, you know, my, my sports fabrics? <laughs> it's also a really good question. And there are labs that are doing really detailed study of microfibers now, because when you think about, um, in almost like bivalves like mussels or oysters which we eat the whole body of um, then you know you're ingesting the fibers and the plastics and whatever else is accumulated in that organism so 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 it definitely is is a concern we just don't know how much of a concern right yeah, that's that's the trick and it's going to oh. take time to find out and i think people you know understandably people want to know now like oh should i should i throw out my fleece should i yeah stop should I buy everything in glass and aluminum now and, and you know and, and my I guess my advice on that would be to, to follow the precautionary principle because we know those things aren't as good for the environment or, or, or you know plastics aren't as good for the environment as these other you know measures we can take so maybe try to reduce your use of plastic as much as much as you can you know? 
I think that's something that we don't talk about enough in terms of what people can do. I love the you bringing up the precautionary principle. This, if this is the worst thing that can happen, you know, do you want to be involved in making that terrible thing happen, or do you want to limit your impact on that? Right, right. And and I, I kind of have the same opinion about you know, buying, if you can, I know they're expensive, buying organic fruit when you can instead of conventional, right? Because you're, you're applying the precautionary principle there too, because you're not only potentially protecting your family, but you're also protecting the people who work in the fields and have to spray those those chemicals and get exposed to a lot more. So, so yeah, I just think, and you know, th there's only so much you can do, right? And you I, I'm then you end up being like me and you feel guilty when you send your kid to a birthday party and they get a juice box with a plastic right. straw. So there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a fine line between, you know, trying to do what you can and being a little bit over, overzealous about it. Right? But, but yeah, that's because it's going to take us a long time to really quantify the impact, you know, might as well do what we can now to, to kind of stave off the, the constant stream of plastics and chemicals. Yeah. And, and, and thinking about, you know, from the, as we mentioned earlier, the individual effects of these endocrine disruptors on the population at large, the individual choices that we make can have an effect on the system at large. So even though you feel like, who am I one person, what can my little, you know, deciding to use a straw now or not use a straw later, what difference is it going to make? Well, if all of us are making those choices and choosing, you know, not to use a straw or whatever it happens to be, sometimes it's limiting, it's reducing the impact. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Even if we can't, we can't quantify it at that moment, if collectively we're, we're having less of an impact. So I get really excited when I see someone, you know, tell the restaurant, tell the waiter that they don't want a straw and that sort of thing. It's, it's the little things, right? Even if it's... Yeah. Again, even if it seems insignificant, like you're saying. Yeah, at the larger level, it becomes significant. So it's the mm -hmm. we all can we all can be a a, a piece of this. Um, I don't want to keep you all day long. We're having a wonderful conversation, and I am loving talking with you about this. Um, if people want to follow the results of your uh, methylation study, find out what's going on with your research, where can they find you online? Sure. Well, we have a website, which I don't op update nearly enough, but that's um, branderlab.net, N-E-T. Um, and so I try to update results of studies there as much as possible. I also, um, I'm on Twitter, and the Twitter feed on my page updates to my, to my website as well, um, thanks to uh, WordPress being really easy to use. And so my Twitter handle is at S M Brander, B R A N D E R. So I try to post updates to research and studies there as much as possible as well. Wonderful. And if people are interested in uh, supporting the kind of research that you do and answering these big questions about the real impact or the danger of these chemicals in our environment, how can they help? How can they do that? I really like to, to give a concrete answer on that. I really love a group called the Environmental Working Group. It's ewg.org. And if you go to their website, they connect all of the latest research on impacts of chemicals, on impacts of microplastics, what have you, with consumer products. And so you can look up particular products that you're using and you can get a score as to how um, how environmentally um, damaging that product might be, or how great and wonderful you know that product might be. And so you basically get like a red or a green flag or somewhere in between. But it's it, it's a really and I, I've shared it with a lot of a lot of friends and relatives, and I, I like it because it's easy for anyone to use, and it, it makes you feel like you have a little bit more control over over what you're doing in your own home or in your own in your own life um, without having to read you know thousands of of papers in the primary literature on you know what's dangerous and what isn't because I think it can be pretty overwhelming 
um, for people to try to figure out what, you know, you're at the grocery store and you have 18 different choices for toothpaste, right? What yeah. Do you, what do you do? So, so yeah, so Environmental Working Group um, is a really great organization and I think super helpful for those kinds of questions. Wonderful. Dr. Brander, thank you so much for joining me today. It has really been wonderful speaking with you, elucidating on so many levels. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. I'm glad, I'm glad the mode I'm decided to stay on this time. I'm pretty I am about. too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, technology, for making this interview possible. <laughs> Uh, everyone out there, uh, I would love to invite you to watch other Twist episodes on Wednesday evenings, 8 p.m. Pacific time at this YouTube channel or at twist.org slash live. You can also subscribe to the podcast. Go to twist.org and find information there. I'm Dr. Kiki. Thank you so much for joining me today. And Dr. Brander, once again, thank you for joining me, everyone out there. Pay attention to this work because our environment feeds back to us. It is what, you know, it's all one big system and we need to be an active part of maintaining it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>